After playing games for years, I think everyone collects a group of favorites that they regularly replay. Maybe it's a classic that you think stands high above everything else in the genre, or it's a game that struck you in the right way at the right time and, even acknowledging all of its flaws, you can't help but love it. In high school, a friend and I had a tradition that we would have a head-to-head -head race through Half-Life every year in December. Clearly, we were the coolest kids in school, and everyone was jealous of our awesome idea. I see Deus Ex brought up a lot as something that's commonly reinstalled to play every year. I could see Halo being a game like this for the generation slightly younger than mine, or Ocarina of Time. I think a person's age has a massive impact on what kind of games they end up liking. It's a sad but understandable truth. Constant improvements in graphics can make going back to older games a jarring experience. But it doesn't stop there. Controls were also worse decades ago. Limited resolution options can also affect a game outside of graphics, with hard to read text that can end up cramping a screen. These sorts of things are like trying to read a book from hundreds of years ago. It looks like English, it sounds like English, but you'll be damned if there isn't something in every paragraph that leaves you wondering if it was written by running a different language through Google Translate. Dungeon Keeper is one of the games that I used to regularly replay. I say one of the games, but it's not like I have a carefully curated top 10 list of favorites or anything. I also said used to replay regularly because around the time that Windows Vista became the standard operating system, Dungeon Keeper became unplayable. I still have the same disc of the game when it first came out. I would install and play through it roughly once a year, blazing through the campaign a little faster each time, until Vista brought compatibility issues and prevented me from playing it for years. Like a junkie that had developed an allergy to his vice, I would search Google every few months looking for some sort of workaround, not really believing that I would ever find one as I did, and that the game would be dead forever. Some of you might be thinking that this is leading to the glorious discovery that is good old games, and how they've resurrected many old titles like Dungeon Keeper since the site first went live in 2008. They do have the game available on the website, but I actually managed to play it again a while before good old games got their hands on it. Keeper FX is a fan project to remake the entire game. Normally this sort of thing ends in disaster, but this particular case is different in that the base game was taken as a foundation and parts of it are being changed piecemeal, instead of having the whole game addressed at once. Put another way, the project is playable and faithful to the original because it is the original, and is closer to a version of the game made better like, say, the unofficial patch mods that you can get for Skyrim and other Bethesda games. I'm not smart enough to understand how the guy behind KeeperFX is doing all of this. All I know is that I was able to play the game again on new operating systems. You also need the files from the disc or the good old game release in order to use KeeperFX so it's not a pirated version either. If you've played the GOG version, it still might be worth it to check FX out. I only tried the good old games version once, and after seeing how poorly it ran through DOSBox, I was even more relieved that the FX version was still around. Maybe good old games has fixed this by now, I'm not sure. Dungeon Keeper was developed by Bullfrog and released in 1997 with the tagline, Evil is Good. There have been games that present players with moral choices or have you playing as an anti-hero, but Dungeon Keeper was the first game that I came across that has you unabashedly playing as the bad guys. The game doesn't pull any punches with this, you're not some secret agent pretending to be evil to take down the underworld from the inside, nor are you the lesser of evil options and out to make the world a better place. The game lets you kill, torture, and conquer, and rewards you with a monologue after every level that glorifies your wickedness. The streets run with the blood of the slain. Screams of pain and howls of anguish rip the night air like a vengeful siren song. This really is somewhere you can take the kids for a weekend. This is all done with dark humor, and while it is true the game doesn't take itself super seriously, it is definitely faithful to its tagline. This was incredibly refreshing upon release. I'm sure there will one day be someone in the comment section that will say that another game released in the 80s that you play the evil side way before this, and that how could I not possibly know about it. But to me, Dungeon Keeper was the first game that let you be the bad guys. It's also a game that has a title as literal as Can of Soup. What do you do in Dungeon Keeper? Well, you keep a dungeon. Multiple dungeons, actually. There are 20 levels in the campaign, each represented by a chunk of land on the map screen. Everything starts off nice and tranquil, and then it's bloodied and pillaged after you're done with it. The levels also scale the same way. The first few are really easy, but the challenge ramps up toward the end. The game doesn't have a tutorial and instead uses the first few levels as a way of teaching the player, although they often resort to explaining things through pop-up messages. Before we get into the meat of this video, I want to give a warning. I think this game is really, really good. So good, in fact, that I want you to stop watching this if you haven't played it. It's about 5 bucks on good old games, and if you can stomach the visuals on the screen right now, then I strongly advise that you play it yourself before I ruin the whole thing. Keeper effects is reasonably easy to set up, and I would stress that it's essential in order to enjoy the game. If you have trouble getting it working, you can even ask in the comment section below, and I'll tell you how I got it running. 
Let's start out as simply as the game does. Every level is underground. You have your dungeon heart, which is effectively the life bar of your dungeon. If it dies, then so do you, and you need to restart the level. You start with a literal handful of imps that you can give orders to by selecting what tiles of rock that you want to be excavated. The imps will then work at these tasks and create tunnels to connect parts of the map or clear an area so you can place a room in it. You can tunnel toward gold deposits that your imps will mine and then collect to put in a treasure room. Once in this treasure room, you are able to spend it on creating more rooms. There's almost always a portal near your dungeon heart, and once claimed, it's from there that creatures will enter your dungeon and become minions. Creatures have needs that can only be provided by certain rooms. A lair is needed for them to sleep, a hatchery for them to eat, some minions need another room for them to work in, warlocks need a library. In some cases, a type of creature won't show up to your dungeon at all until you have the room that they want, or won't join you until your room is large enough to meet their minimum requirements. Dragons want a huge treasure room, for instance. The first 10 levels or so introduce a new room type and a new creature or two that goes along with them. With only one exception, the newly introduced rooms are never directly tied to being able to win a level. With the difficulty steadily increasing, the new additions to your dungeon feel like new toys to play with, rather than mechanics that are still being introduced in a never-ending tutorial. Despite all of these different rooms, the management side of Dungeon Keeper isn't as complex as many other games released by Bullfrog. That's fine, however, because the game has more going on than just keeping your creatures happy and having enough gold to pay them. It is payday. The beauty of Dungeon Keeper's gameplay is in how simple and intuitively it strings interconnected methods of progress. Let's go to the ninth level in the game as an example, Moonbrush Wood. So right off the bat you have your dungeon heart and starter pack of imps. You see your portal behind a wall and that there's some gold nearby. The first thing most players will do is start tunneling for some of that cash and then check the level's map. If there could ever be an argument against the fog of war mechanics rife in so many games today, Dungeon Keeper is it. I'm supportive of the idea that the player can't see an area without having line of sight of it, but having a blacked out map as an outline of the entire level at the start works so well to get the player wondering about what's out there and provides some much needed direction to spark their curiosity. So let's look at all of this. We haven't even built a single room or claimed our portal yet, and already we're planning our first few tasks. Get some gold, get some creatures, and then work our way around to the more interesting parts of the map. What are those gold question marks? What's in that winding path to the left there? There's a locked door across from the portal that's impossible to block off if we clear the rock around it. What's behind that? We're less than a minute into the level, and already the game has given us both short-term and long-term goals, and these are only things specific to this level, and it was all done without having an NPC or a message pop-up to tell us what to do. Because the regular mechanics found in this game that all fuse together into the fun that is keeping your dungeon also adhere to this idea of having the player build themselves in multiple ways at once. From the moment that you first strike the rock around your dungeon heart, you are settled on the path of building your base. First to get some gold, then to dig out a room to hoard your treasure, and then a new room from there to give your minions a place to sleep, and then a place to eat and train so they can get stronger, all the while you're digging out more gold and stockpiling more money. Then you build a library and a workshop, and you have new spells, rooms, and traps being discovered all of the time. Your gold count is still rising. You do some exploratory mining to the next big gold vein that's already visible on the map as a breadcrumb for where to go next, and your dungeon continues to grow. All the while, your creatures are leveling up and you are amassing more and more resources. Everything in the level can be conquered. Everything can be taken. Enemy units? You can capture them instead of killing them. Torture them until they join your side, or let them rot in prison and starve themselves into skeletons that can fight for you to capture more people and make more skeletons. Later on, even death won't save the enemies from being consumed by your dungeon, because corpses can be taken to the graveyard and become vampires. Dungeon Keeper lets you build and run your own engine of evil. You corrupt the very earth in each level. You spread through it all like a tumor, growing stronger with every bit of it that you claim. It's the same sort of stain that you see left on the world map after you've beaten each realm. This gameplay style of a consuming engine isn't the only way to play. Dungeon Keeper offers a surprising amount of different ways to tackle each level, although I do doubt that all of them were intentional. The most prime example of another dominant strategy is to turtle up throughout the entire campaign. There are a few times that this can't work, but there are exceptions to the rule. When your imps have no other jobs, they will run around and fortify any of the walls that are connected to the land you have claimed. Or, if you want them to do it sooner than that, you can pick them up and drop them to force the job on them. These walls then become unbreakable, and not some sort of pseudo-unbreakable that makes them difficult to knock down. They are literally unbreakable until you decide to knock them down. There's a spell in the game that can undo this fortification, but I've never seen the enemy cast it. Gold is usually a limited resource, but you can manufacture things in your workshop for free and then sell them. I think this is a mostly unintended method of generating infinite money. Turtling up like this changes the game significantly, and instead of having to train creatures to high levels in order to fight enemy keepers and heroes before they reach your dungeon, the game instead becomes about tunneling quickly to specific points on the map and putting up walls to forever block the enemies out. Then you can take as much time as you want to create your perfect dungeon and get minions up to max level that can stomp all over the opposition. 
playing like this is conceptually like a building boil of evil that eventually explodes into a murderous rampage. Training creatures like this can take time and is done so passively. As long as you have gold, any creature can be made to gain experience in the training room up to a maximum level of 10. You can speed up time in the game to make this go by faster. It's one of the best things you can do when you're going full turtle mode. Combat is arguably the weakest part of the game and devolves into who has the better army of minions, both in type and level. Some creatures are vastly more powerful than others. Most of these are embodiments of the rooms that are needed to attract them. The Bile Demon needs a massive hatchery. The Mistress needs a torture chamber. The Militant Orc wants a barracks. The Mistress and Vampire are particularly powerful, with hard-hitting range attacks that can churn through enemy groups. But the game is more about the dungeon building and acquiring power rather than commanding the units themselves. I always thought it was a commentary on how the evil overlord can never really rely on his minions to do the right thing. You can pick them up and drop them on claimed territory, and you can nudge them in the right direction with spells, but you can't issue commands directly. Sometimes it can feel like you're wrestling with the limited AI that your minions has, but as I just said, I wonder if that was intentional. The one exception to this rule is the possession spell. I would guess that the Horned Reaper is probably the most iconic thing that ever came out of the game, but the possession ability is the one that always stuck in my mind. Okay, that I swear that was accidental. <laughs> You can assume control of any minion, be it a bile demon or an imp, and the game becomes a first person shooter. You can run around the dungeon and see it from your minion's perspective. You can use their abilities and force them to move to places that they otherwise wouldn't. This is a truly brilliant game mechanic, and I wish other games had it, even if it was only to see things from a different viewpoint. I think it could be awesome in RTS games, Starcraft 2 especially, or maybe even seeing your city through the eyes of a citizen in Anno 2070. Possessing a minion is one of the many ways that you can break Dungeon Keeper. Maybe this is my own bias showing, and how much I love the game after playing it so many times since I was a kid, but I think Bullfrog understood how much fun it can be to destroy a game in this way. There are a lot of cases that push the game closer to a sandbox that allow the player to choose how easy or difficult they want to make it on themselves. The amount of space you're given for each dungeon is the most clear example of this. You can create these huge, sprawling monstrosities on almost every map, or you can choose to play quickly and rush down your opponent. Some levels have secret power-ups. These range from granting a free level to all of your creatures, to revealing a hidden level, and then to transferring an existing creature to the next level after you're done, a minion that keeps all of the experience it already gained. Sometimes you can find these on several levels in a row, so you can keep sending that level 10 powerhouse and then possessing it right at the start, and walking it to the enemy dungeon and winning before they have a chance of ever fighting back. The game can become very easy if you play it like this. But I think this is unlikely to happen on your first playthrough, and so it becomes some sort of guilty pleasure slash reward for players curious enough to see what they can get away with. This can flip to the other side too, and you can enforce limitations on yourself. How far through the campaign can you get without ever using a training room, or ever using magic? How about throwing back every creature you get into the portal except for trolls, and now you have to beat every level with traps and doors only? Or how about you're not allowed to throw any creatures back at all, and whatever random selection the portal deals you is what you have to work with for this level. My personal favorite is to try and beat the game without ever claiming a portal on the levels that you don't automatically start with one. You have to get really creative and use your knowledge of hidden areas to know where neutral creatures already exist in the world, and use them to get started. This also makes you a de facto undead keeper that relies on amassing your army by whittling away what you can for vampire corpses and skeletons. There are also so many little details that add to the game. How creatures dangle in your hand when you pick them up, how chickens will explode when you claim an enemy hatchery. Certain creature types are natural enemies, spiders and flies, skeletons and bile demons, vampires and warlocks for some strange reason. There are unique animations for almost every type of creature when it is put in the torture chamber. Skeletons are getting their ribs bashed in, dragons are getting their wings carved like they're giant turkeys. The end result is a game with multiple ways to play, even if the final goal is always the same. New rooms and creatures add twists between levels, but toward the end it's the difficulty that keeps it all engaging, topped off with the bullfrog charm that the developer was known for. Anyway, if you never played the game and you still got this far, then hopefully I didn't spoil too much of it. It may look basic, but I urge you to give it a chance. The game had a sequel that may be more visually appealing if that's what's putting you off. I think that the original is by far the superior game, but Dungeon Keeper 2 does have its own good moments. I won't go into detail on it because it'll be a future video, along with the recently released spiritual successor War for the Overworld. I haven't played the game yet since it had a bad transition out of early access, but I've heard that it's in a good state now and I look forward to trying it soon. So yeah, that's Dungeon Keeper. So why does the video still have a few minutes left on the timer? Even if you're a fan of the game who just watched this video for a trip down nostalgia lane, you might not know that there are fan-made campaigns for Dungeon Keeper. In the official expansion from Bullfrog, The Deeper Dungeons, the levels are an extreme ramp up in difficulty. Some of them adopt ideas of optional challenges that I just mentioned. 
One of the harder ones has you stuck with a tiny little hatchery and no way to enlarge it. Others are still difficult, but more on the tedious side of things, with massive hero fortresses and a lot of magic doors that end up testing your patience more than anything else. Some of the fan-made campaigns are like this. It may seem a little unorthodox to talk about it unofficial content, but sometimes mods can add so much to a game. There's one for Skyrim called Interesting NPCs that is so good and so well and seamlessly integrated to the game that when I think of Skyrim, I consider that mod to be canon. The Ancient Keeper campaign is one of many that comes bundled with Keeper FX and is one of the most interesting, unique, and engrossing experiences I have ever had in any game. Let's have another warning here. If you love Dungeon Keeper and you haven't played Ancient Keeper, then you might want to consider stopping this video and checking it out. Before you go, I will stress that it is a very different animal than the original campaign and is definitely not for everyone. If you're curious but not sold on it yet, you might want to stick around to hear more before deciding to give it a try. The guy who made Ancient Keeper posted often on the unfortunately named Keeper Clan forums. His name there is Dragon's Lover, and your reaction to that name is a good test to whether or not you've spent too much time of your life on the internet. We should be grateful there's no apostrophe in the name at least. Let's just hope he thinks dragons are cool. I don't know this person, and I've never interacted with him in any way. The only reason I know his name is from googling about the campaign he made. What I find so wonderfully fascinating about Ancient Keeper is that so much thought went into creative ways to make it brutally, punishingly difficult while still working with the constraints of the original game. Nothing new is added. No new creatures or skills or map types or anything. It's nothing but inspired ways of altering the base game in a way that makes it play like something completely different. There are two main ways that Ancient Keeper succeeds. First, is that it realizes that building up a massive dungeon and letting your minions level up for a big showdown, while fun, can be tedious if that's the only way a player is challenged. Like some of the best levels from deeper dungeons, what happens instead is that there are huge obstacles put in the player's way before you can get to the stage where you can turtle up and amass your forces. So on the very first level, a veritable lake of level 10 archers stands in the way of you in the only portal in this realm and all you have are a bunch of imps, a library, and a warlock to figure out how to get past them and start getting creatures. The second way it tests the player is on your knowledge of the game, and this is where I think the campaign has its moments of pure brilliance. On some levels you get hints through the developer message system, and I will admit some of these are too obscure and hard to figure out, but it turns Dungeon Keeper into something closer to a puzzle game. One level blocks you from getting a training room. You have to level up a den of dragons in order to take over the realm, but, well, how? They're stuck on level 1 and all the enemies are level 10. You explore the pre-made dungeon given to you and there's a high level hero in one of the rooms, trapped on a single tile in the middle of lava. That's your training room, and the player is left to figure out how to use it. Returning to the first level, the best way to get to the portal is to trap the archers in the water after you breach through the wall to get there. The temple and guard post rooms are both raised when you place them on the ground, so if you put them on tiles next to the water, the raised part of it is too high for characters to climb up and over it. This allows you to build a bridge safely to the portal through placing it down and then selling parts of it, and then using the disease spell learned by the warlock in the library in order to clear the archers and get your portal. The level then teaches you how to use a workshop to make doors and then sell them to generate gold forever, something that you'll be doing often throughout the campaign. Ancient Keeper is by no means perfect, and sometimes the things it asks of you are beyond what a player could reasonably figure out on their own, not to mention that the updates to Keeper FX may one day break Ancient Keeper completely, but it's so unique that I can't help but love it. Some levels even incorporate well-known bugs as solutions, or have sections where you need to use the possession spell and navigate dangers. There are some tedious parts with similar huge fortresses found in the deeper dungeon levels, but I still recommend trying it out if you want an ultra-hard twist on a game that you loved years ago. At the very least, it's an exploration of what can be done when someone is restricted by the game and needs to push the currently existing mechanics to their creative limit, without having the option to add new things as an alternative. It makes me wonder how some other games could benefit from this kind of intense creativity for optional content. So, that's Dungeon Keeper, we're ending for reals now. Hopefully people enjoy these looks at older games intermingled with newer ones. If not, well, I do plan on reviewing War for the Overworld at some point. My hope is that it adds new ideas that complement what made Dungeon Keeper so great. I think that a lot of old games are surprisingly complex when you go back and play them, and it seems to me that many games today are simple concepts with a fresher coat of paint and a better user interface. Games like Dwarf Fortress can be the complete antithesis of this, of course, but I think a healthy balance could be struck that could make a Dungeon Keeper game vastly better than the original. Thank you for watching, let me know in the comments section what you think, and I'm supposed to beg for likes and subscribers, aren't I? So yeah, if you can do that, go ahead. Thanks.